Let's pray. Well, Lord, we come to you this morning asking you to accept our worship, thanking you for the opportunity to gather, the opportunity to sing, and again, would the worship of our hearts be pleasing to you. What we're going to hear in this text is a very stern warning that what happens on Sunday better have some effect in our lives, otherwise it is not pleasing to you. So teach us what it is that you want from us. Fill us with your spirit that we can hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a continuation, sort of, of the book of Acts. Uh, last week I hit a word, fast and pray, that caused me to stop and explain, and I used an analogy of a championship church, and I said that a championship church is much like a championship team, that there are some people on that team that make things happen, there are some things, some people on that team that watch things happen, and there are others who are left wondering what happened. And that there needs to be within the team enough buy-in of enough of the team that we're going to go for it. We're going to be a championship team. And I said last week that what that would require is for the individual members of the team to also be working on their own outside of practice or outside of the game. So if you want to call Sunday morning the game or if you want to call Sunday morning the practice, the time where we gather together as a team is Sunday morning. But what happens on Monday through Saturday and Sunday afternoon and night, you're going to find out this morning, matters more to God than what happens on Sunday morning. So again, thinking about that analogy of a championship team, I said that there are various churches that we could be like, and I gave different metaphors, and I said that fasting, prayer, Bible study, the spiritual disciplines are like the workout. So let's say that all you do is read the scripture once in a while. Let's call it the daily bread. You do that once a day, and you pray. Well, that would be just like doing cardio in chest day. So you got little tiny legs, like you see these guys in the gym that are really, really big and got itty bitty legs. What I'm encouraging us to do as a congregation is to have a holistic workout that incorporates your biceps, your chest, your back, your legs, all of it, and cardio as well. And that is what the spiritual disciplines are in your life. I said, and this is my son said, well, where's the blanks? Well, the first several points are all review, which is why there aren't any blanks, but it keeps building. The leadership and the congregation both need to be submissive and obedient to the Spirit of God in order to become a championship church. In fact, I was thinking about this. It matters if you could have a pastor who was fully committed to the Lord in every way and have a congregation that was mediocre at best, and that church would have very little impact. But you could have a pastor who was mediocre and a congregation who was on fire for the Lord, and that church would be impacting the community. In other words, your spiritual life matters maybe even more than my spiritual life. Or let's say the collective spiritual life matters more. In a championship church, God often takes the most unlikely person and places them in a position of usefulness. And this is what's different about the sport analogy, right? We're looking for talent. We're looking for natural ability on a sports team. But in God's economy, God often takes the most unlikely person, the person that you would never, never expect, and uses them in extraordinary ways. I am case in point of that. High school dropout, you've heard the story before, I'm a big loser. And that's why God uses big losers like me, they praise the Lord. And then I said that fasting is where the focus was. And I said last week that Jesus never commanded his disciples to fast. He just assumed that when he departed, that they would. 
when you fast and pray, he says. Or when he says the bridegroom will be taken away and then my disciples will fast and pray. So I want to define uh, the spiritual disciplines. And I, this is, again, all review from last week. The spiritual disciplines are the means of grace. That's an intentional word. Because you can't turn the spiritual disciplines, prayer, fasting, Bible study, into a formula where, okay, God, I fast before you, and now give me something. I do lots of Bible study every morning, now bless me. That's not how it works. That's why they're means of grace. God uses the spiritual disciplines, but God doesn't owe you if you do all that you do, he just promises blessings. And the purpose of the spiritual blessings isn't to get you what you want, necessarily. It's to get you to be more like Jesus. And we're going to see that's the problem that God's people often has. And then I defined fasting last week. So again, if you're confused, spiritual disciplines, prayer, silence, solitude, fasting, Bible memory. Um, there's lots of them. And again, I'll go through them at some point. Uh, maybe even after the series in Acts, I'll go through all the spiritual disciplines so that we understand them. Fasting, then, is the voluntary denial of a normal function for the purpose of intense spiritual activity. And again, I intentionally, last week, I left out the word food because I said that you could fast from things like coffee, or you could fast from TV, or you could fast from something that's a trouble spot for you in your life. But every time that fasting is mentioned in the Bible, it almost always relates to food, not anything else. So really, I probably should put the voluntary denial of function of food in parens, because that's really. And then I said the primary passage that I wanted to talk about was Isaiah 58, and we just read it and now contextually, last week I made some points about it, but all of the points that I made about drawing near, this is an indictment. This is not a positive thing. And I said last week that they had regular fast days. The Day of Atonement was their big fast days. The Day of Atonement was the, the high event on the Jewish calendar. It was the day where the sins of the nation were atoned for. They would come and they would fast all day long. The priest would make a sacrifice. He would go into the Holy of Holies that one time a year and make atonement. Now, Americans, when we celebrate something, we do the opposite. We have a barbecue. We have a party. This is not what God wanted. This was the central theme. In fact, the event that follows the Day of Atonement is the Feast of Booths. It's an eight-day festival where you camp outside for eight days. And you forego food on the day of fasting, and you forego air conditioning and housing for eight days. It culminates on the eighth day. And the purpose was to remind you of the captivity in Israel. And so if you get the point here, God, when he wants to celebrate or commemorate something, he's more interested in purging you of sin than having a celebration where your buddies come over and you have beers and hamburgers. And so that's, this is, in other words, not a vacation. It is intentional affliction. Now, we've got to be careful here because the aesthetic monks used to afflict themselves. But there is an affliction here. So cry aloud, it says. God is telling Isaiah, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my, pan my transgressions to the people. And here's what they were doing. Here's their transgressions. Listen to this list. They daily seek me and delight to know my ways. Huh? As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgments of their God. They ask of me. So they seek to know my ways. They ask for righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to me. And they even fast and humble themselves, and I'm not interested, God says. Wow, that is quite an incredible indictment. God says they're coming every Sunday. They're holding up their hands in worship. 
They're delighting to know God. They're saying, draw near to me, God. I want to know you. I want to know your ways. And God is saying, I'm not listening to a word you're saying. I don't care what you're doing. What's the problem? So he's not listening to them. He's not seeing them. Verse says, why have you fasted and you see us not? We've humbled ourselves and you're not taking any knowledge of it. What's wrong? And they think something's wrong. That's probably why they're fasting. And so they keep going. They keep doing their religious things over and over. And they intensify it. And God is like, you're, you're, you're not getting it. It's like this. They're fasting for the nation, for God to bring back America again to its foundations, for God to purge it of all the wicked, evil things. And we're meeting Sunday after Sunday asking God to restore the nation. But on Monday, our lives are full of unrighteousness. God is more interested in using the spiritual... Listen to this. This is important. More interested in changing you with the spiritual disciplines than changing the nation, than changing the community. And that's what they weren't doing. It would be like during the time of slavery. They would all go on Sunday and they would say, thank you for our freedom, Lord. Thank you for, we're free in Christ. He who the Son sets free is free in thee. Get to work. That's exactly what's going on. And we see this in the middle of verse 3. Why have you fasted? You want to know? In the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and you oppress your workers. That's the problem. Sunday worship didn't change the way that you acted on Monday. Monday is the proof of worship on Sunday. Or to say it another way, this is your first God is more interested in righteous living than he is in righteous passion. You can lift up holy hands. You can fast and pray every day. But if then you, it's like you're preparing a Bible study on patience. And you're in that Bible study and in walks my son and I go, leave me alone. I'm in the middle of a Bible study. That Bible study is having zero impact on me, on my life. That's what's going on here. You go to church, you yell at your employees, your hired hand on Monday, your kids, your spouse. That's what they were doing. Jesus said, if you're fasting to be seen by other people, then you have your reward. That's it. You got it. So listen, there is a reward in fasting before men. If you want to be praised by men, fast before men, they'll praise you. There's your reward. Well done. But God is not going to give you any more than that. You got your reward. That's what you wanted. That's what you got. Isaiah says, if fasting leaves you self-indulgent, harsh towards your employees, irritable, contentious, then your fasting, your worship, your prayers, it's not the fast I choose. I want your fasting, your worship on Sunday to produce merciful, righteous, patient living on Monday. No worship, and no, no worship, no preaching, no singing, no playing of instruments, no praying, no fast, however intense and beautiful that leaves us harsh with our workers on Monday or contentious with our spouses at home or self-indulgent in other areas or angry enough to hit somebody, no worship or no fasting like that will ultimately please God. So, fast, this is your next point, and prayer for God to change you. And it's not, listen, it's not that we couldn't pray for God to change our community. It's not that we can pray for God to change our nation. It's not that we can pray for a certain bill to go through. But God is most interested in if my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I want to change you. I want to change you. I want you to be conformed into the image of my son. That's what I'm interested in. 
And this is spiritual hypocrisy. So authentic fa fasting, prayer, worship needs to be an attack on our sin. Listen, I even think about sometimes the studies that we do. We can talk about the text. We can talk about this word. We can talk about what it means. But it needs to transform us into the image of Jesus. If it isn't doing that, then who cares what God's sovereignty and human's responsibility, who cares what atonement means? Who cares what propitiation means? Who cares? It doesn't matter. It needs to conform us into the image of Jesus. That's the point that God is making. Is such the fast that I chose a day? Now, this is what's interesting. I wish that English translations would do a better job of staying consistent in a text when the words are the same. Because in English, if they're different, you think they're different in Greek or Hebrew, and they're not. So I'm going to read it as it's intended. And I'm going to change the word humble as you heard it when I read it. Is this the fast that I chose for you, a day for a person to afflict himself? Is it to bow down his head like the reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Now, this word is very interesting because it's saying, I want you to afflict yourself, but notice in verse 10, here's the problem. And this is the same word, by the way, right here. I don't have my little pointer, but afflicted here, same word as humbled here in the same word. I wish they would have used it. So here's what it's saying. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then you shall rise. Here's what God is saying in these verses. You're intentionally afflicting yourself by withholding food from you. And it is an affliction, right? Who wants to not eat? Uh, right? We don't. We like to eat. So it's an intentional infliction. But then verse 10 says, your workers and the people around you are poor and hungry because you're greedy. So if you want to fast the way that I want you to fast, stop driving your, hard, your workers hard. Take the food that you're not putting in your mouth and put it in their mouth. That's what God is saying. Let them into your house. Take your clothing off and put them on them. That's what God is saying. You're withholding food, and then your workers are over here starving because you're greedy and you're not paying them. They don't have a choice. They're being afflicted by you intentionally. So what does your Monday look like? Tuesday. What is your Sunday? This is the other thing that God was upset about, right? He said, Sunday's my day, but you do it to spend your pleasures. Like Sunday, is it the Lord's day or is it a day to spend it on your pleasures? That's what they were doing. They're like, we checked off our box and now we're going to go do what we want to do. Theology is very practical. Now, I'm not going to get all the way through this passage this morning because we have communion, but I am going to survey, so I'm going to take one more week on this passage. But what we have here in verses 6 through 12 is a prescription for righteous living. If you do this, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, then I will do this, then I will do this. Now, we don't like if-then statements in the Bible because there's a danger. We can turn those if-then statements into formulas, which we call legalism, right? If you do this, God will do this. But I think that's the wrong way to look at it, because if you look at it that way, it becomes like a wage that God owes you. God is the employer. You do if, 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 then God owes you X, Y, and Z. And I've already said God owes you nada, nothing. So don't look at it like an employer-employee relationship. Instead, look at it like a doctor's prescription, which I think, yes, is your next blank. Think of fasting like a doctor's order for healthy living rather than an employer's wages to be earned. 
Because the only wages that God owes you is the wages of sin is, that's what God owes you. So you don't want God to owe you what you owe because you'd be owed death and you don't want death, so you don't want God to be fair in that sense. So think about it as a doctor that's giving you a prescribed regimen that if you want to live healthy, if you want to live holistic, if you want to be in a longevity life, do these things. And really what it boils down to is trusting him that he's the doctor giving you the right prescription. And he says your recovery, your healing will spring will speedily spring forth, it says. If you trust the doctor and show this by obeying him, he will bless you, not merit. So here's, and this isn't in your notes because it will be next week because I want to break them down. Here's 13 things in this passage that the doctor prescribes for you to do. 13 things. Loosen the bonds of your wickedness. Undo the bands of yokes. Let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke that easily ensnares you. This would be Hebrews. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless? Like most Americans, what we want to do, we don't want to let a homeless person in our house. We just write a check to the food bank. But what this passage says is bring them in. When you see the naked, or those who need, cover them. Do not hide yourself from your own flesh. If you remove the yoke from your midst, this one is good. The pointing of the finger. Shame on you. You. Those wicked people. Those homosexuals. Those, you fill in the blank. Stop pointing the finger. If you're going to point the finger, this passage says, point it right at you. That's what the passage is saying. The speaking of wickedness. And if you give yourself and satisfy the desires of the afflicted. Then God promises, and there are seven things. I don't have them because I want to go through them. That if, then God will bless. It's the bottom line. So here's what I'd like us to do. I want to invite you to begin the practice of fasting. Food. Actual food. So here's what I would recommend for you. On Wednesday to Thursday, I would like us to fast as a congregation. I'm going to give you three options. There are multiple ways of fast. This would be abstaining from food, drinking plenty of water, You can do one of two things. And the reason that I recommend a Wednesday to Thursday fast is most people find it easier than an all-day fast. If you can eat breakfast on Wednesday, go over and skip breakfast on the next day and eat lunch. But whatever works. So, at least on Wednesday, don't eat lunch. If that's where you want to start, eat breakfast, fast on Wednesday, and then if you want then you can break your fast at supper. But here's what I'm recommending. Fast Wednesday, no food, Wednesday night, and Thursday morning. And then break your fast on Thursday afternoon at lunch, eating a healthy meal. This is not a time to go to King's Buffet. And break your fast that way, you'll throw up probably. What are you fasting for? Well, I just gave you 13 reasons to fast. Where is your blind spots. And I'd like us to do this as a congregation together for God to begin to reveal to us as individuals where God wants to grow you. Because I already told you, at some point this summer, we're going to come to your house and we're going to knock on your door and spend time with your family and ask you, how are we as a congregation providing for you to grow as a spiritual family? What resources Do you need? So it would be good if you spend some time before the Lord fasting. So you take your lunch break and instead of eating, you spend your time with Jesus asking him where you need to grow. What I thought was interesting, and here's where I'll close. And again, we'll hit this for one more week. Doesn't this sound vaguely familiar to you? 
Didn't these words, I wonder even if Jesus was not meditating on Isaiah 58 when he said these words. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him, he will gather all the nations and he will separate one from another as a sheep. shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place his sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And he will say, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you at the foundation of the world. Now listen to these words. Doesn't this sound exactly like Isaiah 58? For I was hungry. You gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked. Boy, all of those have been hit by Isaiah, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you a drink? And when did you see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did you see sick or in prison and vi visit you? And the king will answer, truly I say to you, as you did it for the least of these brothers, you did it unto me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me. You cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry. Yes, you attended church, but you never knew me. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You wrote a check, but you didn't let me in. Naked, you sent your clothes, but you didn't clothe me. And you will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them, saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray.